I got some, thank you. So, we will return to uh, the book of James after a uh, one week break. I was not here because of the men's retreat, which uh, was an excellent time of fellowship up there in New Hampshire. I'm convinced that the burden of the book of James and his main desire is to picture for us what a true faith is, what a true faith looks like. And he's begun and is telling us and continues to tell us that a true faith is a tested faith. Speaking of which, um, I had my weekly oncologist, my, my try every three months oncologist visit last week. I know some of you like to know, keep updated on this. I had a great visit, praise God. He said there's no sign of this cancer coming back. Um, but every, I've said before, every time I have that visit, it's kind of a little bit like the day of judgment. I don't really think about it until the week of my blood test. And then it's sort of like, okay, what are we gonna have here? Um, and you know, it's just sort of the gift that keeps on giving. And he said, well, you're doing so well, I don't have to see you for six months. So that's a good thing. Thank you for praying. I know it's been a corporate enterprise. You have prayed. I hope you'll continue. Not even so much about the cancer, but about the fruits that James talks about our trials having. That we could be joyful in these things and grow in steadfastness. So James, and maybe that's why I'm drawn to this book of James, after having been through all that chemo and everything, is uh, he really resonates with me now in a way probably that he didn't before. So a true faith is a tested faith, and you can count on that throughout your life. And if it's not one test, it's another. If it's not something, it's going to be there because God loves you, and he's shaping you and wants to make you steadfast and joyful in those trials. Those trials can be so difficult that we will often find ourselves in need of wisdom, as James says. And he encourages us that if we lack wisdom, the giving God is ready to give to all who ask him. And that's a wonderful encouragement for our prayer lives. The God who graciously gives. And now, as James, continue, James continues to speak to us about tested faith and the wisdom that God gives us, he's going to open up one particular acute trial that's going to happen to us throughout life, a trial for which we will need wisdom. And that trial we can call the treacherous waters of our possessions and our position in this life. The treacherous waters of money and position and possessions. As he puts it, rich man, poor man. There's a trial, there's an encouragement, there's a warning for each in his passage. And let me ask you to give your ear then to God's word. James 1, verses 9 through 12. Let the lowly brother ex boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flowers fall and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let us pray. Our Father, our possessions, our position in this world are such temptations, such trials, such treacherous waters that we don't even realize it sometimes. Lord, you speak to us here so clearly and pointedly about this, I pray you'd give us ears to hear. Let us realize the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give me clarity as I speak your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Dealing with contentment with our possessions, with our position in life, are indeed treacherous waters. And the author of Hebrews nails it exactly. In Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9, he prays this. 
Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. You see the point. A person who doesn't feel that he or she has enough might be tempted to steal. The person who feels they do have enough will be tempted to forget God. What do I need God for? I have a roof over my head, I have a good job, I have plenty of income, what do I need him for? And we see these warnings echoing throughout the scripture. Our Lord Jesus Christ, particularly in the Gospel of Luke, has much to say, mostly about the danger of possessions and wealth. So the poor man can be tempted to steal, and with that, the disease of the heart called envy, which Ecclesiastes warns us fuels so much of what people do. They're driven by envy of their neighbor, malcontentment, and grumbling. Those are the temptations of the poor man. And then the rich man is tempted to make an idol of that wealth and rest in it and forget God. We might put it this way very simply. The poor man can be tempted by the money he doesn't have. The rich man can be tempted by the money that he does have. Now someone sitting there today might say, well, pastor, you're kind of missing the point here because really I'm not either rich or poor. And I suspect if we did an anonymous survey, probably no one in our congregation would say, yes, I am poor. Sometimes we feel that way. Uh, sometimes we do poor mouthing, as my, my parents used to say, pre- uh, groaning about being poor when you're really not. Um, and, and probably most of us wouldn't say that we're rich either. We're kind of in the middle. Some of us are nearer probably to being poor. Some of us probably nearer to being rich. But we're kind of in the middle. And you might think that what James says kind of misses the point then. I'm not really poor. I'm not really rich. But don't miss the point. Don't be a legalist here. James is not talking about the size of your bank account so much as he's talking about the shape of your heart. There is nothing quite like possessions and position, either having it or lacking it or wanting more of it. There's nothing quite like it to expose our hearts, to expose the idols of our hearts, or where our true faith lies. Jesus said very plainly that no one can serve two masters. So in our lives, we will either bring our possessions and our position under the lordship of Christ, or our life will fall under the lordship of our possessions. One of those two things is going to happen. James offers an encouragement and a warning to rich and poor. So consider this first then. Let the lowly brother, James says, boast in his exaltation. Lowly is a good translation because James is not simply speaking of the poor person. He's not simply speaking of the one who doesn't have enough money. He's he's speaking of someone who is low in position, someone in society uh, who doesn't have a great position. John Bunyan was a tinker. He went from town to town fixing uh, pots. He would have been considered a lowly. That's that's kind of a low job. Uh, It's not a glamorous job. Someone said to me recently, I think they were were joking, they said, so you went into the ministry for the glamour, right? (laughs) I said, what, are you kidding me? I went in for the glamour. Um, But the point is, the lowly brother, either in his own view or the view of others, yes, he doesn't have much in terms of money, and his job really isn't, his calling, his position isn't one that's very high. That's who James is speaking to. And notice how God's wisdom is shaped God's wisdom is so often counterintuitive. God's wisdom is so often 
the exact opposite of what we think. The last shall be first. Jesus is always turning the wisdom of the world on its head. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. Well, how is the lowly brother exalted? Uh, that, seems, that seems backwards. It's the wealthy who are exalted, right? It's the wealthy who get glamour. Uh, the poor are abased. James says, no, that's wrong. This brother is wealthy because of his faith and because because of who he has in his life, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's an implied warning here, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and that is not to be a grumbler, not to be bitter about your station in life or your level of income, uh, your small bank account, but rather let the lowly brother boast, rejoice, be glad in his exaltation. What exaltation could James be talking about? Well, obviously, he's talking about the fact that, that you have Christ. You don't have much else, but you have Christ, and in Christ, you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. The poor man can look at his circumstances and can say without irony, I am rich. I am rich in the things that really count and the things that really matter in life and in eternity. And this is right at the heart of the gospel. This is not, like Mark said, just a way to keep the masses um, uh, co compliant because you'll promise them a heavenly hope and that'll keep the poor from being, you know, causing you any trouble. No, no, no. This is right at the heart of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 8 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that in him you might become rich. And he wasn't talking financially. He was talking about the riches of being in Christ and all that comes from eternal life. I know I've quoted my friend Pastor Pau from Manipur, India, to you before, but it deserves another saying. I remember talking with him on one of my visits over to India, and Pastor Plow said, our lives are poor and miserable. We know that all we have is Christ. But what he was saying is Christ is more than enough. And that's why James says to the lowly brother to boast in his exaltation. This is, this is so much at the heart of the gospel. Remember at the announcement of Christ's birth and, and Mary utters the Magnificat. She celebrates the wealth of poverty. Listen to what she says, part of what she says. With the coming of Christ, he has brought down the mighty from their thrones. He has exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. God is always reversing things. He's always taking the wisdom of the world and standing it on, standing it, on its head. Uh, what man values, God despises, the gospel says. What God loves, we so often despise. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. I, I know there are always questions that rise on this topic. I think it's because it makes us uncomfortable. I think because it gets right to our heart. Just a couple of quick comments about questions that might arise about this. So, Pastor, are you saying it's, it's not okay to try to get a better job or try to get a better, not just more money for my family, but just a job that engages me more? Of course it's not wrong to do that. Nothing James says teaches you that that would be wrong to try to get a better job or be more engaged in what you're doing. But I would just say to you, watch your heart. Don't let that quest for more or better be just a covering for the sin of grumbling, lack of contentment, and envy. That would be my counsel on that. Someone else might say, well, Pastor, 
I mean, so if being lowly is such a great blessing, then why would we ever help the poor? If we help the poor, wouldn't that really be taking away their blessing, someone might say. There are lots of reasons to help the poor. First of all, God commands it. Do we need another reason? God commands that we help the poor. Love demands that we help the poor. You can't see your brother bleeding and wounded on the side of the road and just walk by and not help him. Jesus says, love your neighbor. Love demands it. Um, Helping the poor is good for us who maybe have a little more because it helps break our idols. One of the signs of idolatry about money is that we lack generosity. When you lack generosity and willing to give and help those who are in need, my friends, that's a very bad danger sign for your hearts. Sometimes we see some of the top people and the top candidates, and you see how little they give to charity based on what they have, and it's amazing. I've got to wonder about, I've got to wonder about where their hearts are. This helps break our idolatry. I've said this before going to India. I've seen it in Haiti. You've probably seen it in other places. One of the astonishing things about poor Christians is how generous they are. How generous they are. They just literally give you the shirt off their back. It's as if we don't have much. We know that. We're not putting our hopes there. So what I have, I'll give to you. I'll share it. It's no big deal. But we who have more, we tend to be so stingy and so worried. And uh, it's just a, a bad test for our heart. Another reason for giving to the poor is because it causes people to praise God. <laughs> because it stimulates uh, thankfulness and an appreciation of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Read 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 when you get a chance. It's all about that. So, our first point is, James exhorts, let the lowly brother, uh, let the lowly sister boast in his or her exaltation. The lowly brother can look at his circumstances and truly say, I am rich. Let Let the rich boast in his humiliation. Now again, here we go, counterintuitive, God turning the wisdom of the world on its head. Wait a minute, the rich are not humiliated. The rich are the glory boys. They're the ones we all envy. They're the ones we're all fascinated with. The lifestyles of the rich and famous. And let's face it, we do tend to be a little bit fascinated with wealth and wealthy people. I've noticed somewhat of a sports fan over the years, how, how sports reporting used to focus on mostly the athletes and maybe their statistics and whether they won or lost and how good they were. Now, you cannot separate sports reporting from money. And every sports report, oh yes, he just signed a six-year deal for $60 million. If you're a sports fan, you get sick of it. But there's a fascination about it. The next guy's going to get 70 million. The next guy's going to get 80 million. We tend to be fascinated by it. The Wall Street Journal, every week, every Friday, they have a complete section called Mansion. And that's exactly what it is. It's high-end real estate. And there's something fascinating about that. This year, this week, they featured uh, chateaus and wineries that you can buy complete with winemaking staff. I mean, just over-the-top stuff. You know, uh, we were in Manhattan this week just for an enjoyable day, Patsy and I, and walking around. And I'm quite sure there's a pecking order if you live in Manhattan of your address. If you have a Park Avenue address, if you have a Fifth Avenue address, you're up there. Now you might have to come down a little and live only on Madison Avenue or Lexington Avenue and then, you know, down to 34th Street or whatever. But there, and, and there's a fascination that we tend to have, and at a popular level, People Magazine. Isn't that what People Magazine is about? Kind of the lifestyles and the misbehaviors, I suppose, of the rich and the famous. One question about verse 10 is, does James talking here about a rich believer, or is he talking about a rich unbeliever? He says lowly brother, but then he just says the rich. Um, typically, in working through James, I read about 10 commentaries. 
all the way from Calvin through the Puritans on up to modern commentaries. And it's interesting how on this point, the commentators are split about 50-50 as to whether James is talking to a rich Christian or whether he's just talking to somebody in general who is rich. And there are good arguments you can make on both sides. Um, if this is not a brother, J James may have that in mind because he doesn't call him a brother. Um, but then you have to understand, if, if this is not a Christian he's speaking about, then you have to understand James's language as being very sarcastic, very ironic. Oh, yes, let the rich boast in their, in their humiliation. That's not typical for James. But later on, in James chapter 5, he has some scathing things to say to the rich, and there he clearly is talking to non-believers. Um, he could well be speaking to a brother, though. Because the language about the, the flower of the grass passing away, uh, the flower falls, the beauty perishes, that's not really last judgment language. That can be just a description of what's happening. Just think about it, rich, wealthy Christian, if you're comfortable in this world, your riches aren't going to last forever. Your comfort isn't going to last forever. You are, in a worldly sense, are not going to last forever. And in that sense, James could simply be echoing um, what, what Paul says to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 17, as for those who are rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Grass withers and the flower fades. If this is a, if this is a, if the poor brother, and, and I tend to think he's talking here to a Christian, but you know, it's, it's like things in scripture where there's a question over the interpretation. Let he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, if the shoe fits, wear it. I think he's probably talking about a rich Christian. Ultimately, it doesn't matter because the rich are going to pass away just like everybody else. It's a fading glory. Take it to heart. So if the poor brother can look at his circumstances and say, I am rich, the wealthy brother should look at his circumstances and say, you know, when it comes right down to it, I'm just a wretch, like everybody else who's saved by grace. And that's one of the insidious dangers of having some wealth, is if you're a believer, you begin to think that somehow you deserved it. It must be that you're basically a better person than that poor guy who can't pay his bills, than that poor woman who doesn't manage her money very well, is always getting into debt. It must be because I'm just a better person, I'm more righteous. What a, what a deadly danger that is. So James is saying the poor brother should look at his circumstances and say, I'm rich. The rich brother should look at his circumstances and say, I'm a wretch. And despite all this stuff I've got, I'm only saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me summarize it this way, uh, quoting a well-known verse from the prophet Jeremiah. This is what Jeremiah is telling them. This is what Jeremiah is telling us. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. He's not denying that we might have some riches. But let him boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight. James is telling us what Jeremiah did, boast and rejoice in the things that God delights in. So our first point was let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, let the rich boast in his humiliation. And doesn't James describe that so hauntingly and beautifully and yet painfully? Like the sun rises with a scorching heat and withers the grass, so also will the rich man pass away in the midst of of his pursuits. Our final point, spoken both to rich and poor, is to lock on to God's promise for those who love him. This is verse 12. Some, some people take verse 12 to come with what follows. I think it can also take it with what James has just said. That's how I take it. 
What a wonderful encouragement it is. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Saving faith is faith that believes God's promise. It's that simple. Saving faith is trusting the promise of God. And in this case, the the promise James obviously has in mind is the promise of eternal life. He who believes in me, the Lord Jesus Christ says, has passed out of death into life to live forever in the blessings and beauty of the kingdom of God. As we know some scripture, that's a present possession. It's, It's perfectly appropriate In fact, encourage for a believer to say, by grace, I have eternal life. But it's also a future promise. And that's what James is emphasizing here. Those who have stood the test will receive the crown of life. And he's not thinking here of the gold crown and jeweled of kings. He's thinking about the laurel wreath that they'd give you in the Olympics when when you'd finish the race. The crown of life. We could even say the crown which is life. But but listen to this. True saving faith not only confesses the truth. What's a true faith? Who is a true believer? Not only someone who confesses the truth. That's vitally important to do that. But true saving faith loves the Lord. Do you catch that in what James is def- how James is defining the true man of faith? To whom is the crown of life promised? To those who love him. To those who love the Lord. I ask you this morning, do you love the Lord? I don't just ask you if you confess the truth. Do you love Jesus? Do you love him? That's the mark of a true saving faith. No, we don't do it perfectly, of course not. I don't do it perfectly, but do you love the Lord? I can imagine two soldiers in the army. And I can can imagine one who joined because he needed a job. And he wants the benefits, and he pays very close attention to those benefits and doesn't want to do any more than he has to, does the bare minimum, marks his time, hopes to get a good pension. Uh, That's one kind of soldier. Then there's another soldier who does all these things, but you know why he joined? Because he loves his country. Those two soldiers are completely different. Which kind of Christian are you? Are you kind of uh, bare minimum? I want the fire insurance policy. As As I've heard it put sarcastically, I just want to know how much sin I can get away with and still go to heaven. God forgive. God forbid that we would think that. Or are you the kind of Christian like that soldier because you love the Lord? You do what you do because you love him. That's what James says. Those people are going to get the crown of life. Do you realize, and and, and how do we grow in love for our Lord? By meditating on the fact that Christ became poor for our sake. By meditating on the fact that the Lord Jesus died for my sins. And we can only truly confess him if that wonderful gift moves us to love him. The Lord Jesus stands before us this morning just as he did before Peter on the beach at the resurrection, and he asks us, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? More than your possessions. More than your position more than what people think of you or say of you or how they applaud you or how much glory and glamour you get in this life. Jesus says, do you love me? 
That's what a true saving faith looks like. Amen. Let's respond. Um, couldn't help but think of Thou who wast rich beyond all splendor. Number 230, it's usually a, an Advent hymn, but wonderful. Anytime. 230. Thou who wast rich beyond all splendor.